minds and um, just give us the nudges that we need um, when the timing is right. Help our conversation, um, help our community to discuss some hard topics and um, some topics that hopefully will be enlightening and new. Lord, I pray that this evening will be honoring and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so last week we talked about living truthfully. So my question always is, what stuck or what did you think about in the last week in regards to what we talked about or discussed last week? Yes, please do. Um, so my, my, my favorite verse in the Bible is uh, J uh, John 8, 32, and it's, uh, for ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, which means, of course, that you shall know Jesus Christ, and the, cl and the closer you know him, the, the closer to the truth you become. And then my, uh, our, our leader here was a little surprised when I told her that the uh, that verse actually happens to be etched on the entrance foyer wall at CIA headquarters, and uh, anybody else surprised? No. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> it was, <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, it was selected by the first director, his by his father, who and who was a Presbyterian minister. And for those of you who don't know my background. I used to I used to walk by it every every day when I was at the agency, so it was a, a nice reminder. So it was uh, so that was that was uh, what came to my mind, of course. So and of course, if you want to learn more about the intelligence community, I'm giving a lecture in October. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> Where is your lecture, Russ? It's up at Pequot Lake High School. Pequot High School. Is it? It's through Community Ed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Things that kind of stuck with you or just kept coming back like, oh, yeah, we talked about that. Linda. Mm -hmm. It's interesting what he shared because our daughter got to go on a tour of Washington, D.C. with her school, and it was a Christian organization. And so we were made aware of all of the Christian influence and the scripture throughout. And I thought, oh my gosh, if everybody who goes there would just focus and take it in and let yeah. it penetrate their heart. Um, so I just had a comment on that. But I would say um, over the years, my husband and I have had a number of different scenarios where people have come in, uh, out of hardship and have stayed and lived with us. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting when... Uh, your immediate family can argue or have a disagreement or um, and then you have this guest in your home and you have them for eight and a half months. <laughs> yeah. So the whole truth thing is, is right. It, yeah, we, we've had a number of different people from different cultures and different situations yeah. and different ages right. stay with us. And so we always try to say we are, that we're not perfect. Yep. We're striving for healthy. Yeah, we're striving for healthy. And That's um, but it is just all those unspoken rules that you yeah. have in your house and yeah. things that you do. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, I can't walk on eggshells for nine months. We're just going to have to be real. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. That'd be hard. <laughs> be careful. We forgot to mention one thing. What? Well, I'll leave that. We had a Bible the study. people at home need you to have it. Oh, okay. There, uh, there's um, every Wednesday at noon we had a Bible study and uh, we called it CIA also, Christians in Action. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Anything else? Okay. We'll link. Um, there will be a link um, in what we're covering today with promise keeping and truthfulness and all of the things that we covered um, tonight. We're going to talk about hospitality and worship, and um, we're going to have more discussion than we have um, before because I feel like it's the culmination, it's the last class, and I really want us to be able to 
um, have a conversation in some smaller groups and then as the larger group. So there'll be a little bit of your own kind of quiet self-reflection and then there'll be some small, you know, group like however we want to do it and then we'll come back together and do some sharing as well because I think it'll be easier for us to have ideas of application um, of the things that we're talking about. So hospitality is our first topic. When you hear the word hospitality, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Inviting. Having people in your home. Rick, what did you say? Inviting, In inviting people over. Sharing. Sharing. Friendliness. Friendliness. Warmth, and Warmth and welcoming. What about when you walk into the doors of Timberwood Church? What examples of hospitality do people? Greeting. 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 Yep. Coffee. Coffee. <laughs> let it run short. Right? Don't let it run short. Coffee, baked goods. It's an effort to be hospitable, be inviting to people. That's okay. What else? Hospitality. Greeting. Greeting. Yeah. And allowing people to come into your mess sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, Eric has talked so much about hospitality over the years. Um, and like he's very passionate about hospitality. And I remember a few years ago, um, he did a class um, and shared a book with small group leaders about hospitality. And it just really kind of like woke me up a little bit. Like, I, I would think about, you know, my house is messy. I have four kids. Like, it's, I can't have anybody here. It's crazy in this house. And um, waiting for the house to be clean or waiting for my kids to behave <laughs> nicely or not be disruptive was never going to happen in reality. And so I um, actually, I actually had to work and be pretty, um, intentional about not like scurrying around the house, you know, hollering at my kids to pick up their stuff or empty the dishwasher or do whatever they, stuffing stuff the yep, stuffing stuff under the counter or in the, I never really did that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I have done other things like put dirty dishes in the oven. <laughs> as long as you don't forget them, right? That's a bad day. If you forget Tupperware in the oven, it's a bad day when you turn it on. Yeah, yeah Judy. We've had that conversation where once in a while where, you know, Annette will be cleaning up to get things, and she likes everything to be, and she mm -hmm. uses that way pretty much all the time anyway. Now the kids are gone, it's a lot easier. Yep. You know, for a long time. Yep. But, uh, you know, we, I've jokingly said sometimes, that when you have people over, you almost need to leave it a little messy because, you know, you want people to be comfortable. Right. Because otherwise they come and everything's too perfect. Yeah. Then, you know, they're going to expect feel bad. To feel like if yes. If they're going to come to their house, it has to be perfect. Yes. They're yeah, perfect. it's a perpetuating yeah. thing, right? If somebody comes to your house and it's perfect, then they're going to feel like their house isn't perfect if Plus it can doesn't look like. Some work too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like right. Like relax. <laughs> relax. <laughs> people, you know, it's my mental illness. The cleaner it is, the crazier I Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, Judy. Uh, there was a minister's wife that told me when I was a young mother, don't ever feel like your house has to be perfect because then mm -hmm. they will feel like yep. they can't have you over. Yeah. Yep. Be there for a meal. Yep. Don't answer for fancy meals yep. that mm -hmm. somebody can't do themselves. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've lived by I that all my life. Too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Val, oh. please. Yep. <laughs> um, I always felt like my house was a ministry to other women because it was a mess. Yeah. And they saw that this is real life. Yeah. 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 I like that. Anybody else? I had an older babysitter tell me once that um, the, the house should be dirty enough to be comfortable and clean enough to be healthy. And there you go. I like that. I like that. Yeah, I mean, 
I don't know what it is. I like a clean house. I mean, I like, okay, my husband would argue. I like everything to be in its place. Whether or not it's really clean is optional in my world. So, um, yeah. I mean, we would go on trips, and I'd be, like, scurrying, like, to clean everything because I want to come home to a clean house, right? Because as soon as we get in there, we're going to make a mess. And um, so why did it matter? I don't know. What I want to do tonight is talk a little bit differently about hospitality and kind of open up a different view of it. Um, the last couple of years, because of a couple of classes that I have had, um, books that I have read, I've really been challenged to think about hospitality in a different way um, other than the typical, like what we just talked about. And so um, my definition, I've worked through um, a couple of papers and books and thinking about this. My definition of hospitality is this. Hospitality is an offer and acceptance of a welcome, both reflecting God's grace and graciousness. Hospitality is an offer and acceptance of a welcome, both reflecting God's grace and graciousness. So let me dissect that a little bit. Our practice of hospitality actually has to start with us. And what I mean by that is that we have to accept this invitation, the hospitality of grace that God offers us, right? So we are, it, we are first accepting this offer. God is extending this grace. And I'm going to connect this idea of hospitality and grace. Last month in May when we did communion, um, I kind of introduced this idea of hospitality and grace being connected. And so it's his offer, it's our acceptance, and so in that definition, it's an offer and an acceptance. And it started with God's grace. So what I want to do is have a little discussion about what God's grace is first and foremost, because I feel like in order for us to have a better understanding connecting hospitality with grace, we need to talk about what God's grace means and what we think about that. So in a small group, like however you want, like three people or three people or however you would like to, just take seven minutes. And um, Lee, can you put slide one up? So this is for, the, for, y for you guys. This is also on your worksheet handout. Um, but for those of you that are at home or are going to watch this later, this is the reflection and discussion um, that the groups are going to take place or have. So God's grace, what does that mean? What does God's grace mean? And, th and I'm thinking about it in like a more orthodoxy type of way. What do you believe about what gra God's grace is? And then the second question, what does that feel like and what does that look like? What does that feel like and what does that look like? And that might, you might want to think of that more in that orthopraxy kind of manner. So remember, orthodoxy is what we know to be true and then the orthopraxy is what we do in addition because we know what is true. Okay, so seven minutes. We'll come back and have a little discussion. You guys discuss however you want. Meet new friends, meet community. You can have five. I won't limit you.
I'm going to pull you back in one minute. Okay, I hate to interrupt because I hear such good conversations. You can stay kind of relatively like in these spaces if you want to because we'll, we'll come back to these groups. So what is God's grace? What does it mean? Anybody can speak for a group. Come on. Here. Here, Heather. <laughs> I said it's a gift of love and acceptance. Is it on now? Is it on now? Okay. You're it's on a, now. a gift of love and acceptance that you can't earn and you don't deserve. Yeah. Yep. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah. yeah. It's unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. Yeah, that's actually right out of like an official definition. <laughs> Anybody want to add, Dan? For me, just in a general standpoint, I think of it as God accepting me as I am, mm -hmm. where I am at that at any given point in my journey. Yeah. Yep. Anybody else want to add, Jim? I'd say sometimes it's hard for me to reconcile what God's grace is for the way I've behaved as a father sometimes. Right? <laughs> and not yeah. so gracious about things that happen. Right. I agree with you 100%. Sometimes we, sometimes we can be hurtful, you know, unintentionally or, yeah. Yeah. What about, um, what does it feel like or what does it look like in, in, the, in its practicality? What is it? God's grace. I said that I thought, I said that I thought it required, I thought it required some action on our part, not just what we were thinking or believing, but some action on our part. Mm -hmm. Until we started kind of talking about it and we talked about the fruits of the spirit and not all of us have been gifted with every spirit. Yeah. And so there must also be a measurement where we could help someone else yeah. in that hospitality. Yeah, and we're, yes, you are on to something good. Yeah. What else? What does it feel like? What does it look like? Like, practically speaking, what does it mean if we have received the grace of God or accepted his invitation? What happens then? Uh, we mentioned, uh, we, we, discussed in, uh, this topic and decided that in certain ways there's a serenity that's given to us and that uh, we're able to, we're challenged to accept the things we can't change, uh, to, uh, to also go and uh, change the things we can and the wisdom to know the difference, which yeah. is of course the serenity prayer. Yep, 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 I like that one. Good yeah, good guide. Um, yeah, so this serenity, um, oftentimes, like I think about peace or freedom um, that can come, that is offered, that does not mean that we automatically all the time experience peace, you know, because it doesn't, because the peace 
does not mean the absence of pain and suffering, but the absence, you know, the, the peace that we desire means that we can be okay on either side of whatever is going on because we have the grace of God, we are in communion, excuse me, communion with God. We'll talk about that a little bit. Anything else come up in your discussions? Yeah, Dan. I think like you were talking about actions, you know, what does that mean? And, uh, you know, for me, I think a lot of it means, you know, it's extending that grace to other people. Um, you know, whether it's you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off and your first day instinct is to, <laughs> you know, yell at them or yep. beat on your horn or yep. whatever, but then instead to stop for a second and think, wow, I wonder what's going on in their life. Mm -hmm. Uh, and just extending yeah. grace and forgiveness to people around you, and maybe they do something that's hurtful mm -hmm. to you, and realizing that we've been forgiven so much, mm -hmm. you know, can we forgive? You know, can we try to look beyond the first thing that happens and try to think about what's underneath that yeah. and think about how we can engage with people in a way that might actually, rather than be hurtful, yep. like we were talking about, you know, hopefully get to the point where more and more we are engaging in a way that deflects the anger and pain mm -hmm. and instead invites, yeah. you know, conversation that mm -hmm. might lead mm -hmm. to something that can be part of sharing right. a, a different perspective. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? So God's grace is not something we deserve. The word deserve is like, uh, it's a trigger for me at my house because <laughs> when a child or a teenager or a young adult says something about what they think they deserve, I'm like, ooh, you actually don't know what you actually really deserve <laughs> or you do and you're forgetting. Um, but yeah, I just, I cringe like, when people say, I deserve this, or I deserve, you know, I think about, and I, in, uh, in full disclosure, I have, I have been there in my adult life, and oftentimes feel like I deserve something because I have suffered long enough, or whatever, or when I got my first administrative job, I'm like, I deserve a new car, and Steve's like, do you really, though? I'm like, yeah, I do, so I just went out and bought it on my own, and then I call him, I'm like, I need a ride to the cities to pick up my new car, and he's like, what? because I felt like I deserved it, <laughs> and nobody affirmed it. <laughs> yeah, so this whole deserving thing, um, yeah. So we receive this, and when we receive this after, offer this gift of grace, we're adopted into the family of God, right? And so when we're adopted into the family of God, we're recognized as his children, and when we bring children into our lives, into our homes, what do we need to provide for them? Everything. Everything. <laughs> Everything. They are completely dependent on us, right? They're completely dependent on us. When they're young, you know, and they're not 100% dependent on us, what is our responsibility as a parent? Keep them safe? Train them? We train them to... Eat healthy food. Yep. Yep. Cl clean up your mess. Walk. Crawl. Avoid danger. My pastor in Northern Virginia. My pastor in Northern Virginia uh, would told told me that uh, we, uh, God gives us children so that uh, we can uh, teach them and they can teach us. Yes. <laughs> so true. So true. Yeah, I mean, I think that we think about, um, you know, our parenting, we're teaching them, we're directing them, we're giving them guidance in life, and as they get older, um, I think about, like, my young adult children that live in my house right now, and they're so ready for, like, complete independence, and they threaten it often, and I'm like, go, yes, <laughs> Try, do it. <laughs> I'm so in favor of this. 
but they still need some of that guidance and they're, they can be sometimes rebellious and they can like make, do the wrong things and you're like, ah, we've talked about this for like 20 years, like come on, you know? And so I, I was reflecting on this and thinking about this and, and I'm like, I bet that's how God feels all the time about us. We're like these rebellious teenagers that just are constantly like, you know, two steps forward, five steps back, <laughs> three steps forward, four steps back. And so it's just this constant kind of support. Like our kids will always need some level of support from us, love, guidance, um, babysitting, you know, whatever it might be. And so it's constant. It doesn't end. And what I was reminded about, cause, because we're using Romans um, chapter 12, verses 9 through 12, as kind of this guide, and that reminded me that this is the guidance, a piece of the instruction that we are being given as children of God, because it says the, this is, these are the marks of a true Christian, a follower of Christ, somebody that is in the family of God. And I'm going to read it one more time. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute, uh, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, Never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Bam. See you tomorrow. No. <laughs> what, what? Romans 12, verses 9 through um, 21. So here, again, is that guidance that we are receiving, one of the pieces of guidance that we receive in the Bible. And um, in light of how, in light of this, what we just talked about, and we've read it every single week, in light of Romans chapter 12, 9 through 21, what does hosp how, does hospital how does hospitality play out? Like, we've mentioned, we've talked about some of the things about the way it looks like, but after reading this, can we get more broad and, um, and even more, maybe even refined, broad and refined at the same time, <laughs> about what this hospitality might look like? Uh, you know, from the verses founded on love rather than duty. I mean, yeah. he starts right out, let your love be genuine, yes. and then he goes to that. So doing yes. hospitality, I think we talked about that a bit. Yep. Doing the right thing for the yep. wrong reason sometimes yep. isn't uh, necessarily, a, yeah. it's still good, I guess, but it's right. better if we do it for the right reason, because we truly love, not because right. we feel like, well, we have to. Right, yeah, and we talked about that last week when we were talking about living truthfully, and sometimes when we have to be truthful, and it might hurt a little bit, <laughs> The, it might hurt the receiver a little bit, but because it's, in, it's delivered in genuine love, um, you know, we're hoping to be helpful um, in a genuine, loving way. What else? Jim? I think we're often looking for that big event. Yeah. Like, like Mary Lynn is, is good at hospitality, and she often says, well, if the stranded school bus stopped at my house, I'd be ready. Yeah. But that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> right. But People do need to merge into line in mm -hmm. the traffic, and uh, somebody with a stroller needs the door held open yes. for them. 
And I think we probably, if we look for it, have these e events every day where we could extend we hospitality that takes five seconds. We certainly do. Yeah, hospitality that takes very little effort, hopefully not a lot of thought. Like that's what, I feel like that's what we're, we work for, that it's not a lot of thought. Like you don't even think twice about opening somebody's door. You don't even think twice about, um, you know, picking up somebody's coffee. My kids came home the other day, <laughs> teenagers. Some weirdo paid for our coffee in line. And I'm like, what do you mean some weirdo paid for your coffee? <laughs> this was somebody like doing a, like a good deed. They were being gracious and generous, not weirdo. <laughs> oh gosh, I said, did you pay for the person behind you? They're like, no, we got a free coffee. <laughs> Oh, God. It was a teaching opportunity. <laughs> it was a teaching opportunity. I think there's yeah. Words bless, bless, rejoice. Don't do. do you want to expand on that? Well, I'm thinking of um, rejoicing in somebody else's good fortune. Yeah. yeah. Um, no. Blessing what they have done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And some of that may be it may be simply jealousy. It may be just not, not even knowing or yeah. understanding, or, um, or it might be something you couldn't do. Yeah, yeah. And we talked about that last week, right? We talked about speaking truthfully, and and how often do, does our truth involve affirmation, and lifting somebody up, or praise, or blessing them with an affirmation? You know, um, I think about that. I think about that a lot. You know, how often I am affirming or blessing somebody. You know, this uh, verse 15 is a good reminder. You know, rejoice with those who rejoice and mm -hmm. with those who weep. Yeah. It's not just like always rejoice. I mean, right. sometimes when people are in sorrow, we need to yep. be in sorrow with them. Yeah. Not just be like, oh, well, cheer up. You know, uh, right. good in the whole Lord. And, yes. You know, Yes, yes. I think that's important. Yeah, so, um, yeah, weeping with those wh who weep, celebrate with those who celebrate. So it's, it's not always the best thing. It's sitting with somebody who is in sorrow or in a bad spot. Yeah, and just sitting with them. I'm a problem solver, and so I've had to work really hard <laughs> the last couple of years as I've learned more about myself to not... N not solve somebody's problems if that's not what they're looking for and to just sit and be present and listen and maybe you know feel what they're feeling with them yeah anything else I think I think it it really talks a lot about putting other people's needs in every way above your own mm -hmm. And there's really this underlying um, idea of not being selfish. That it's, it's like seeing people's needs, meeting them, and not thinking about your own and mm -hmm. being offended in the process. But there's something that's so hard to do about being really tender with somebody else's heart. Mm. And I, I think mm -hmm. it's kind of laying out how to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I like, yeah, it's hard to, s it's, it can be hard to be tender with somebody else's heart. Really. Yeah. Yeah, and so this is helpful in, in telling us how to interact with one another. So I think, like, on a deeper level, hospitality is about our hearts and our willingness to extend the same kind of grace that we experience with God. I feel like it takes like a part of our heart to, to do that and not just our will. Because sometimes it's hard, mm -hmm. you know? Sometimes it's hard. It's easier to extend grace to some people than others. I was thinking what she said and, and also, <laughs> I think you've shared this before too, I'm more of an A personality, go, go, go. Yes. And I think we have to be willing to allow God to interrupt our schedule 
interrupt our five things I got to get done today list. Um, yep. My husband is so spontaneous and in the moment, and he sees these things throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I pray very hard in the morning to say, Lord, let me just walk in step with you yeah. and to just have the eyes that you have mm -hmm. and just, and I wish that I was intentional every second mm -hmm. of the day, right. which I'll, maybe in heaven, that'll, yeah. that'll be that way. Right. But yeah, I think for those of us that are schedule oriented mm -hmm. and task oriented mm -hmm. and try to get everything done, mm -hmm. you just have to allow God to interrupt yep. your day yep. and and you'll see what will unfold. Yeah, I um I wonder what would happen to those of us that are kind of that type A in a in a in a culture that did not reward production or productivity. Like what would we do? I mean honestly. We're in a culture that really rewards productivity and what we can get done, you know. Multitasking is kind of, you know, oh, I can do this and this at the same time. But no, you actually can't. Brain research suggests that you don't actually multitask. Like one task is getting less attention than the other. So, yeah. Martha Mary. Martha Mary. Right. Yeah. Martha Mary. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, maybe mm -hmm. for somebody that you might look at and think, well, you know, that's an <laughs> interesting, mm -hmm. interesting person. Uh, and yet, you know, everybody has a story. Yep. You know? Yep. And uh, yeah. it's just taking the time, like you say, we're, we, we feel like we're busy. You know, yep. like we got to get this done and this done and this done. And being able to take the time sometimes just to realize that, huh, I wonder what that person's story is and then letting that person story. Yeah. You know, yeah. And then yep. to react to that. Yep. Uh, one thing I'm trying to do more of that I kind of picked up from reading the book, uh, you know, about the true Jesus eyes. Which book did you read? Is that, uh, Which book did you read, Dan? Pardon me? Which book did you uh, read? Mark Laberton? Let's see. This one? Yep, yep. that one. Okay. Loving Your Neighbor. Yep, The Dangerous and, Act of uh, Loving Your Neighbor. Is, you know, that whole aspect of listening and, uh, and hearing other people's stories and then one thing in particular that I don't do very well that I'm trying to do more is I talk to a lot of people, but a lot of times, you know, I never n learn what their name is. Mm -hmm. And part of that's because <laughs> I figure I'll forget anyway, okay? <laughs> but part of the thing that came out of that book for me was the importance of names mm -hmm. and the importance of recognizing someone with their name. Yeah. And, you know, basically taking the time. We just had an experience yesterday with a waitress and after she told us her story, which was quite <laughs> lengthy and came in many cereals as she came back and forth with the coffee, um, amazing story. And yet, you know, towards the end, you know, I just, I just asked her her name, mm -hmm. you know, and then, mm -hmm. you know, and then used her name and, and the importance of names and recognition yep. that when we ask for somebody's name and we recognize their name and we use it, yep. you know, we are uh, recognizing them as a person, yep. you know. Right. And so I think that's a really important thing that I'm trying to do more is go that little bit deeper and mm -hmm. not be quite so focused on what I want to do, but try to take the time to hear somebody's story, even if it's kind of convoluted and, yeah. and <laughs> interesting as this one was. And it was good. Yeah. Yeah. I read a um, book um, maybe a couple of quarters ago, and the thing that stuck with me is this idea of being in the presence of people while being in the presence of God meaning paying attention to what God is telling me about this person, what he sees, you know, what he sees in this person, not what I see sitting across from them and listening. Um, but yeah, so I've thought about being in the presence of people while being in the presence of God. You know, like, yeah, he's everywhere. He's always here. But, but how do we deliberately pay attention to the fact that he is present 
when we're present with people and what is it that he wants us to see and hear about this person that he loves. Okay. Um, The other thing about this kind of hospitality, I think, results in communion. And so when I say communion, I don't mean the Eucharist. I don't mean participating in, um, you know, the Last Supper with each other. But Eric did a really great job last week of connecting communion to being in community. And so I think about hospitality and the, re- and the communion, that takes place or happens as a result because communion is as simple as a relationship of recognition and acceptance. And so even if you don't know somebody, can you at least recognize them and accept them, like acknowledge them? Um, You know, and not just like high on the street, but just like people that we wouldn't normally recognize or take the time to recognize. So this communion that we're invited to with God, he recognizes us as created in his image, and he will adopt us into his family regardless regardless of our past, regardless of our present sinful behavior or whatever shortcomings or imperfections we have, and we don't deserve it, like we talked before, Um, but he offers us grace anyway. And grace, which we talked about, hospitality and communion starts with us. Do we extend the same grace to ourselves? So we talk about being gracious to other people and hospitable to other people, but how easy is it or not easy is it for us to extend those things to ourselves when we reflect on who we are? Do we reflect on what we think the world sees or do we reflect on what God sees in us? And so how gracious can we be to ourselves and extend that hospitality to ourselves as well? And so when we do that, um, I think that we can have a full understanding of receiving that and what it means to receive that. And then I also think about, can we extend or open our hearts to the, other, the others in our life that are not like us, the others that are not like in our social location, have those similarities as we, as we have in, the, in our social location or in our spiritual location? What if this other person did something illegal? Or what if this other person doesn't believe what we believe? What if this other person isn't nice or says hurtful things sometimes? What if this other person or other doesn't live the way we think they ought to live? And so um, I want to, we're going to do another slide. Um, Of que- uh, another question, and then we'll have a little bit of discussion. And, um, and then I want to be very careful about how we talk about this recognition and, and acceptance of others because there, there's a message in there that I do not want people to hear. So take a minute. Um, you can discuss with the people around you, or if you want to be independent and reflective on your own, you can. What might a relationship or act of recognition and acceptance of the others outside the others we are comfortable look like? That's a mouthful. So thinking about, like, there are others, right? Anybody who's not us is an other. But you others that are not me are part of my social location. It's easy for me to extend this grace and hospitality. We have so much in common. We're in the same social location. But others outside of us, so the people that are not part of what we have here or not part of our community of Timberwood or the city or wherever we work or 
our country or our belief or like whatever it is. So what might a relationship or act of recognition and, ex and acceptance of the others look like? So take a few minutes. You can discuss with that somebody, you can discuss in that group that you had or reflect on your own.
I'm going to bring you back in a minute. Okay, let's bring it back. The teacher wants to come out real bad. <laughs> okay, we're not, um, Keep the keep that conversation. Um, we're gonna come back and we'll share some of it. Um, what I want to be clear about in that I am, I'm not suggesting that we are looking the other way or accepting illegal, illegal or abusive behavior, um, but what I am suggesting is that when we're talking about hospitality in this way, we're talking about recognizing a person's humanness regardless of what they have done. Um, and this goes back to this, the practice of dignity that we talked about the first week. Um, and how do we see people? And what, does, what is the criteria for dignity? Humanness. That's something that um, Miroslav, I didn't talk a lot about um, Miroslav's work, um, but that whole idea of a person's humanness um, and dignity is a really um, th uh, uh, core of the writing that he does um, in A Public Faith. He has a second book. Um, I can't remember the title of it. Um, I lent it to somebody. Um, but it actually gives you practical um, views or practices about what this actually looks like on a topical level. like kind of breaks it down like um, incarceration and you know all of these different kind of social topics that are de you know debated and so he kind of goes through them it's a it's a really interesting book it really yeah yeah yep yeah so it's a public faith how followers of Christ should serve the common good common meaning common all all yeah so um, that book was really influential in my thinking about um, hospitality and all of these practices that help with building community um, if hospitality is, is then seen through this lens of grace like we've been talking about how does this change our interactions and our relationships our views and our opinions of people and so I'm assuming that that was part of the discussion that you just had, right? What is an example, one example from this side and one example from this side? Anybody want to share how it might change, how you view? Um, we had just talked about, like, one way that this could look is by just showing other people your willingness to take one step into their world um, and to see the world through their lens. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody want to share from this side? You guys. We, uh, we thought about how Jesus associated with the undesirables right. of his day. And of course today we have, we have people who are in the LGBTQ mm -hmm. community, we have people who are pro-abortion, mm -hmm. and we also have people that uh, you know, um, have other mm -hmm. religious views than us. And uh, Jesus certainly would have talked to them and, uh, and, and, uh, and planted at least a seed 
Right. And I would be, I would point out that even in this group, even mm -hmm. in the community of Timberwood Church, we are going to have different political views. We're going to have different views on different social issues or, you know, whatever it is. And so even in here, I think it's a mistake to assume that we all have the exact same beliefs. Um, and we do have to be careful about making those assumptions. Okay, I want to shift to this practice of worship. When you hear the word worship, what comes to mind for you? What's an example of worship? Like the very first thing that comes to your mind. Lee. Lee. <laughs> yeah. Music. Props to Lee. <laughs> Music. I think, I mean, uh, initially for me, that was, that was the first thing that came to mind, is that worship is through music. Thankfulness. Thankfulness. Expressing gratitude. Gratitude. Uh, yes. Yep. Quiet. quiet. Worship is quiet. Mm hmm Solid. Adoration for God. Yeah. One-on-one -on -one. One -on -one with God, yeah. Like solitude? Or meditation, like, yep, mm hmm Just being in the presence. Yep, mm hmm Yeah. I think there are so many different um, acts of worship and or um, spiritual practices, spiritual disciplines. I mean, we've only scratched the surface of some of what these practices are. Um, we've Prayer is another thing that people think of as worship. And um, if we look at Google, which I feel like most people, if they're gonna look something up, they just go into Google and they type in the word or the phrase. So this is what Google says about worship. The feeling or expression of reverence or adoration for a deity, the worship of God. Um, another one, the acts or rites that make up a formal expression of reverence for a deity, a religious ceremony. Um, and the, I mean, and there's, there's lots. Like if you Google something, it's not just one definition. You've got, you've got a variety. And then Wikipedia, I think, is the second thing that people look at. So Wikipedia says that worship is an act of religious devotion, usually directed towards a deity. So they're being inclusive of all different religions. For many, worship is not about an emotion. It is more about a recognition of, of a god. An act of worship may be performed individually or, or in an informal or formal group or by a designated leader. That's a little bit more robust. Um, Tyndale um, Bible Dictionary, which we have here at the Library of Timberwood Church, um, has a lot to say about the history of worship in the Bible, but it also very simply states this. The vocabulary of worship in the Bible is very extensive, but the essential concept in Scripture is service. What? Yeah. So with those definitions in mind, um, what were the verbs that came out? What were the verbs, what verbs did you hear? I know I only read them once. You know what the verbs are without even me repeating the, the definition, I bet. Expression, act, praise, serve, expression, yeah, those were the verbs. And so what, is th what does this mean? These are action verbs, so we actually have to do something. And so because, um, because of the grace of God, we act. Remember, our doing comes from our being in Christ. It's not the other way around. We don't act in order to receive the grace of God, because that's works righteousness, that's not what we're talking about. We don't have to earn it. And so our action comes out of our relationship with God. In one of my classes, I wrote uh, a paper 
on worship, well, I've written a lot of papers, and I've kind of condensed a few things into what I'm going to read to you. And I think I put it on your handout. Did I put something on your handout about worship? Okay, that's mine. Um, Worship is a posture that acknowledges God's grace and provision in our lives. It is also an active response of thanksgiving and praise that plays out in our daily interactions with the world. Super broad and inclusive intentionally because I think that um, worship can look like a lot of different things. When we go back um, to Romans chapter 12, the, the first two verses in it are another expression of instruction for us. So let's go back to Romans 12. Page number, Rick. 947, chapter 12, verse 1. 947. Romans, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So our lives are an act of worship. So the things that we do are an act of worship. And even the things that we don't even think about can be an act of worship, because worship goes back to our relationship and our understanding of the grace that God has given us, right? So our behavior, our actions towards other should be a reflection of what we have received in grace from God. And so um, the next, the last slide, I, did, I didn't do three. So let's skip three and go to four, Lee. So This is a big one, and we're going to spend the rest of the time doing this, but we're going to do it um, in a couple of different increments. So um, the first one is um, personal reflection, and I've left you quite a bit of room in here. And so all of these questions will be for you as an individual and then a small group, and then we'll kind of come together and discuss them. In our lives... Um, Our lives are to be acts of worship, given the practices that we've talked about in this class, dignity, gratitude, promise-keeping, living truthfully, and hospitality. Given these practices that we have discussed, what does this look like? How does it play out? And what practice is hardest for you and why? So do this by yourself first. I'll give you five-ish, seven-ish minutes to do, probably five minutes to do that. I'll give you five minutes to discuss as a group, and then we'll come together.
if you're ready, I'll invite you to discuss in your group. We'll do this for about seven minutes and then we'll come back together.
Okay. Can we come together? You ready? Okay. So, what do these practices look like? Ev like, um, if you have different examples of what dignity or any of these practices would look like, practically speaking, you can share those. But um, what were your discussions about? What was something maybe um, personally that you want to share? Anybody? From any of the classes, not just, I mean, because I feel like all of these questions funneled into, I mean, all of our classes funneled into this, these questions, so. Oh, come on, I left 10 minutes. <laughs> Molly. You're not. It's easier to be, to look good to a stranger than it is to your own family. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to behave, so behave nice and. Yes. Yes. Kind of a Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> yes. Aren't we all, actually? I mean, to some degree. Dan. Yes. I have a good example of what not to do. <laughs> I, um, on Monday, I got into a dumb argument with a man. With a man? I, with a man. A I stranger? Got, I got, no, oh, okay. I know him, but is he not sitting next? Total, is he, si is he sitting no, next to you? No, he okay. wasn't around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and what, because I didn't treat him with dignity at first, that he had opinions that I thought were stupid. And um, in essence, I, well, what did I said? Um, all people that do things differently than I would do and their differences bug me because I feel they are wrong. My way is the best, therefore I have shut them out. Mm. And it's like, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. So as mine is a good example of what not to do. So just do the opposite. <laughs> Treat them with <laughs> dignity from the beginning. Yeah. Listen. Right. Mm. You know, he had a, a he came from his his viewpoint, he had a background mm -hmm. that brought him there. Yes. Yep. And I just yep. thought, no, you're wrong. Yeah. So. Not helpful. No, <laughs> not in the least. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's super common. I mean, we all do that. I'm, we all do that. Make it right. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Because you know yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Finding him and. Yeah. Yeah. Apology is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Admitting you're wrong is a hard thing, mm -hmm. but it's also a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That's honest and. You raised your hand. He grabbed the mic for you. <laughs> <laughs> so nice of you, Phil. Um, well, oh, we, great. Last week uh, when we were in Dallas, we pulled up to a gas station, and there was three guys um, looked like they were homeless sitting in the against the wall. And um, you know what? I, I wasn't even thinking about, but to show them dignity you know, just talking to them and making conversation. And um, they saw our license plates from Minnesota. And so we had a good conversation. And, um, but you know, I, I feel like I stop short too often mm -hmm. to um, not bring Christ into the, into the picture right then. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, I, you know, as much as I fault myself for that, I, I was happy to be in a conversation with these three guys. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, my husband was, you know, I don't know, he went into the gas station. <laughs> I don't know, he wasn't I right. Was <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, uh, just to, I think my thing was I have to be, live more intentionally. Mm -hmm. That we just go about our day and we go to the grocery store, we go whatever, mm -hmm. we do whatever. But, to look more uh, intentionally for opportunities to show Christ's love. Yeah, yeah.
like wear that lens of graciousness so that you have this. Like your rose colored glasses are like grace colored glasses. Yeah. Anybody else want to share? And for the last uh, five weeks, we've all had very nice conversations and uh, had great thoughts and intentions. And I think the biggest challenge I have in front of me is to take all this and actually put it into action. And instead of just walking out the door and say, ah, oh, that was a nice Wednesday night evening mm -hmm. and, and, and living it. And, uh, you know, I, I wrote Amy earlier in the week and I said, one of my biggest character flaws is the, the, the need for attention or recognition or to uh, impress people. And I've had to, uh, I've struggled with that. But I did get some support. Uh, uh, they, I was told that uh, they had uh, they had three sons too. So being the youngest, it was a big challenge. <laughs> you know, you're always competing. Yeah. Yeah. So, but uh, it was uh, that's uh, one of my my character flaws that I, um, I I it's 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 a low self esteem is what it is, and as Amy reminded me, it's um, God. We don't have to impress him. He loves us just the way we are today, and uh, and we can go with that and, and move forward, so. Yep, yeah, I, it's a struggle to not um, desire the attention of humans. Yeah, it's normal. Unfortunately for yep. many of us. Yep. Um, I think for, uh, as I think about this whole piece of all these things, you know, uh, one of the things I've struggled with sometimes in reading the, the other book and looking at it is uh, sometimes, you know, I can just kind of feel like, oh, there's just so much mm -hmm. that's wrong with the world. And therefore, you know, I can't make a difference in it. Mm -hmm. uh, you just kind of feel overwhelmed. Yeah. And I guess, you know, from your aspect of thinking about where do we go from here, you know, I, I think I'm trying to try to be more intentional about what I can do and some of these smaller things, but do try to, you know, try to work more at incorporating them, and particularly for me, and that is getting, doing a better job with the other. Yeah. You know, the people that, quite frankly, you know, I'm not necessarily mean to them, but quite frankly, what often happens is I just ignore them. Yep. You know, they yeah. we pass by, I don't mm -hmm. intentionally think about it and try to be present Mm -hmm. with them and like you said Amy with the Lord at the same time and yeah. seeing yeah. and understanding to some degree at least what's happening and just trying to be friendly and build some bridges yeah like we talked about a little bit in our group that aspect of you know planting the seed starting a relationship you, you can't yeah. you can't make a meaningful impact on a person if you have no relationship with them right you know you might make a beginning some small thing mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes God can just use that in amazing ways, and uh, he certainly has done that in our, I think, as I look at my own life, and mm -hmm. I see how God took different people and different things to move me closer to where he wanted me to be, then I think, you know, we can all do that without having to feel like we have to do everything. Yeah, right. I do. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it can be very overwhelming. I think, um, like, one of the very least of the things that we can do is see people. Mm -hmm. I mean, just see them and acknowledge their, like how many people are here on a Sunday morning um, that we walk right by and we've seen them week after week. Judy and I had a great conversation last Sunday about um, finding the people that are by themselves or standing by themselves. And so I challenge um, all of us, you know, on Sunday or the next time we're here, look for that person who's sitting by themselves or standing by themselves that um, they might feel invisible. And so I think the very l at the very least, we can see people. Yeah. Um, I wanna just kind of bring this to a close um, with a couple of things that I found really helpful. Um, in Christine Pohl's book, living into community, she said this, the goal um, in all of this is not to try harder to build community or to get the practices right. It's about living and loving well in response to Christ. 
right? And then she gives this warning of subtle idolatries, which I think is interesting when we talk about, you know, practices. If we see practices as the next skill set that we need to achieve, um, we will have missed the point when we offer welcome or live in gratitude, when we make and keep promises or live truthfully, we are responding to the practices of God. Our experience of community grow out of the practices through which we echo the goodness, grace, and truth we find in Jesus. So just that subtle, you know, if, if we're working at these practices, like I'm not good enough at that practice yet, I need to work harder. Um, so don't get too, you know, down on yourself about not doing these well every single day um, because these practices aren't necessarily the goal. The practices are a means to do what we are called to do um, in loving others well. And so, yeah, the practices are there and they're called practices because they're practices, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, yeah. Thank you all for coming. This was a delight. I'm really um, pleased with the conversation and the interaction, and hopefully you have connected faces now. So on Sundays and Wednesdays, you have more people um, that you know and can say hello to and connect with and know the names of, like Dan said, knowing names of people. So let me close this in prayer. Father, I thank you for this wonderful group. I thank you for those that are not able to be with us tonight um, that will watch later. I pray that they will um, experience a sense of connection um, through the words and through the reflection that's provided. Lord, I thank you for the honesty um, and, the, and the real um, struggles that have been shared. I thank you for the hope um, that these practices give us and the practical um, direction and wisdom um, that come from your scripture uh, in regards to what it looks like to live the way you would want us to, loving others well in reflection of your love for us. Lord, I pray that we would go into the world, that our um, actions would be reflections of your love and your light, and that people would be curious and drawn to us. Um, I pray that we see people that we take time to listen to people, that we take time to invite people into our worlds and our hearts. And Lord, I just pray that that would build your community and our community and relationships, and they would be pleasing to you. We ask all of this, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody.